I want to thank you uh, for worshiping with us this morning. I want to thank you for worshiping with us online. I love that technology over the years can bring us together uh, for a time such as this. I know that today, uh, I know for many of us, is going to be an emotional day, so I'm going to do my very best uh, to make it through this day as best I can. Uh, you have been an incredible community of grace uh, who have loved us, uh, who have accepted us, uh, who have challenged us, stretched us, uh, and changed us. Uh, and I hope that over these past five years that you will have felt the same about our time with you. Uh, you are an incredible, amazing community of faith. Uh, and so over these past five years, I want to say thank you for everything that you have done, uh, for loving me, for loving my wife, for loving my boys. You are a remarkable community of faith. I do have just a few quick announcements, and I do apologize again. I'll probably shed a few more tears uh, by, the, by the time this all is over. Um, but uh, there are a lot of announcements that we want to make, and there are a lot of great things that are happening here in the life of Belleville First. And one of those is, is that every Sunday, now that we are back uh, physically meeting here in this building, uh, it takes a lot of hands to make this ministry work and to make the worship service happen. Uh, and so if you are willing to be a greeter or an usher, uh, please contact the church office or please contact Greg Parcell. He is out there in the foyer as I speak right now, making sure that all temperatures are checked uh, as you come in. And so if you are willing uh, to be used by the kingdom, uh, I want to encourage you to reach out to our church office, contact Karen, or contact and talk to Greg Parcell today. We need ushers, we need greeters uh, to make everything happen. Uh, as, as, it, as make this operation run smoothly. So uh, please see one of them. Also, if uh, you have not received a, a communion uh, cup, uh, we have the prepackaged communion uh, cups. Greg is standing there in the back. Uh, at some point in the service, please get some of those because at the end of the message today, I'm going to lead us accordingly in the sacrament of communion. So I want to encourage you to grab some of those. Uh, as we worship later on in the service. Um, also today from 2 to 4, uh, we'll, we'll have a kind of a goodbye reception uh, for the Lens uh, for us. Uh, and so I want to encourage you, uh, if you feel comfortable, you can come and uh, say goodbye uh, as we uh, begin a new chapter in our lives. And so that is from 2 to 4 uh, here in the Fellowship Hall today, and it's a come and go uh, reception. Also, we have three more weeks of our... Um, Friday, or not Friday, but our uh, Tuesday uh, lunch service there with Whiteside, and so uh, we want to encourage you. It's a great way to connect with others, and so if you're interested in serving, we, me we meet every Tuesday here at 1130 uh, in the Fellowship Hall. We mask up. We have gloves. We make the sandwiches. We have a wonderful assembly line. It's like down to an art form now, uh, and then we go out into the community every Tuesday and distribute uh, lunches to those in need, and it's a great opportunity for us to connect and serve uh, our community that we call home. And so we have three more weeks of that here at the church at 1130. Also, Dwight is continuing his 13-week uh, Bible study on Deuteronomy called uh, From Crisis to Community. And so I want to encourage you uh, to join on Zoom. Uh, you can, you know, participate in this from the comfort of your own home. It's a great study. Dwight is an amazing teacher and professor. Uh, and so encourage you every Wednesday at 6.30, uh, find the link either on the Facebook page, church's Facebook page, or uh, via your email. And I know that there have been some uh, uh, issues with our email, so if you're not getting them in your inbox, uh, check your junk or your spam folder, because uh, there's a good chance that they're in there. Uh, and so that's how we send out every link for Sunday school and for all of our other studies. Also, we are continuing our partnership with the Restore Network. Uh, we are partnering with their Back to School Parade. You should have received a link uh, in your email to their Amazon uh, wish list, and so I want to encourage you to go on to their Amazon page, uh, find their wish list, uh, and buy, you know, purchase some of the supplies that the kids are going to need for this upcoming school year. Over the years, we have maintained a, a wonderful partnership with the Restore Network, and we're going to continue that this year uh, as well. I had shared earlier, and I want to just reiterate this. You, yes, thank you, Reagan. You have been a wonderful community of faith. One of the things that I look for as a pastor is, you know, you get to put up with me uh, throughout the years. 
Um, but it's the way in which you have loved on my wife and on my three boys that mean the most to me. And you have modeled grace, you have modeled kindness and generosity uh, each and every day. Uh, and so on behalf of my family, my three boys, uh, I want to say thank you for how you have shaped us, molded us, encouraged us to continue to be the people that God has called us to be. The future at Belleville First is bright because of the God who calls us. God is faithful. He will be with you. He will guide you. His grace will go before you and prepare the way as God has prepared the way for us to go to Naples. And I had shared on Facebook a little earlier, but you know in the Nazarene tribe it is never goodbye. It isn't just until next time. We will see each other again. Thank you for these past five years, for all that you have done, for the friendships, for the laughter, for the tears. One of my greatest joys in life is to be a pastor and to walk with you through the ups and through the downs, to be at your bedsides, to be in your homes, to bring God's word to you each and every week. It is a privilege and it is an honor. And it has been so for five years. So on behalf of the Lens, again, I want to say thank you. You are an amazing, beautiful community of faith. But will you stand with me this morning as we continue to worship? Our psalm this morning comes from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. It says, Let my whole being bless the Lord. Let everything inside me bless His holy name. Let my whole being bless the Lord and never forget all his good deeds. How God forgave all your sins, heals all your sicknesses, saves your life from the, print, from the pit, and crowns you with faithful love and compassion, and satisfies you with plenty of good things, so that your mouth is made fresh like an eagle's. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity we have to worship you. May everything that is said and done in this service this morning bring glory and honor to you. And all God's people said, Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we have come into this sanctuary. Lord, having been reminded through song that all of creation... Lord, sings your praises. Lord, the majesty of the Rockies. Lord, the endless blue and beauty of the oceans. To all of your creatures, Lord, they sing your praises, and so should we. You have been faithful. You have walked with us, Lord, through this journey we call life. You have empowered, you have enabled, you have given us the grace to overcome our burdens. You sent your Son. You raised Him from the dead. You sent your Holy Spirit, Lord, on Pentecost Sunday. And you continue to empower us and to equip us, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit to be a holy people. You are faithful. You are just. You are merciful. You are kind. You are gentle yet firm. Father, and I thank you for this community of faith for the journey that we have been on these past five years. I thank you for the victories that have been won. I thank you for the transformations that have taken place. I thank you, Lord, that you were with us through some hurt and through some pain as we've lost loved ones. You comfort us in our time of need.
Father, I thank you for the many blessings and the many gifts that you have given to each of us. I pray for Belinda Floyd, Lord, as she gets ready to head up, Lord, to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. I pray that your grace would go before, that you would be with her and the doctors and the medical team. Give them wisdom. Give them strength. We pray for all of our our teachers and all of our students, Lord, all across this country as they prepare, Lord, to either go back to school or to continue to do learning from home, Lord. There are so many decisions that need to be made. There's so much uncertainty and angst. Father, I pray that you would give peace to the parents. Give wisdom to the educators and to the administrators. Continue to be with our medical teams and personnel, our doctors, our nurses, our dentists, all of those who work in the hospitals, all of our essential workers, truck drivers, grocery stockers, our first responders. Father, we are thankful, Lord, for the men and women in uniform who have served this great nation. I pray that you would be with them, Lord, as they are spread out throughout the globe. Keep them safe. Bring them home back to their families and to their loved ones when their tour is done. Father, I pray for for Belleville first. Lord, that you would begin to lead them and guide them to the next pastoral family. That you would give them wisdom and discernment. That you would guide their decision. And that their best and greatest days would be ahead of them as they move forward in mission, being salt and light. Lord, right at 1901 Lebanon Avenue. I pray that you would be with us, Lord, as we begin that journey down south. I pray that your grace would go before us as well. These are always bittersweet times, but we are thankful for your daily presence in our lives, working in our midst. May we glorify you by the life that we live. May we draw people, Lord, to you by the life that we live. And may we be reflections of your grace in this world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our ushers will be at the very back of the service uh, at the end, and so if you brought a check uh, uh, or you brought change or whatever, you could put that there in the offering plates at the end of the service. Uh, Or you can always go online if you're listening online right now, and uh, you can go to our Facebook or on our link on our website, uh, and you can give safely and securely through our website, or you can always contact your local bank and and set up a bill pay. Uh, It's just a few clicks of the button. It's easy, it's effortless, and it's painless. Um, Also, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the service, Uh, if you are worshiping online uh, or if you are uh, first-time guests here uh, in the sanctuary, uh, in the seat backs in front of you is an information card. We would love for you to fill that out, or if you're worshiping online, there is a virtual Connect card. Uh, We would love to get to know you in the days and weeks ahead and how best we can serve you uh, as a local community of faith here in Belleville, Illinois. Well... A little over six years ago, I was standing on top of a ladder, uh, on the very top. Uh, Stephanie was not present, so I could get by with it. Uh, And I was in a church foyer in Heber Springs, Arkansas, and I was putting the the final touches, cutting in uh, at the very top of the ceiling uh, there in the foyer at Heber Springs Church of the Nazarene, when all of a sudden I had gotten a phone call. Uh, and, and my phone was down, and I could hear it ringing, and so I, I go down, because you just, as a pastor, you just never know who's calling you, and uh, when I looked at the screen, I saw that the caller ID said North Dakota, uh, and I, I remember thinking to myself, I have no clue. I don't know anybody uh, from North Dakota. Who would be calling me from North Dakota? And, and I honestly thought, I'm not going to pick this up, because it's a sales call. 
right? We get those all the time, and uh, I now have this habit where if I don't know what that number is, I don't pick it up, because if it's important, they will leave a message. But for whatever reason, that day, I decided I was going to humor myself. Uh, and so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to find out who this is that's calling me from North Dakota. So I picked it up, and on the other end was Dr. Jim Kramer, who was then the district superintendent of the Illinois District. And he said to me, good morning, uh, Aaron, I hope that you are doing well. My name is Dr. Jim Kramer. I am the Illinois uh, district superintendent, uh, and I have a church that I would love for you to consider in Belleville, Illinois. Well, we had talked for a few moments there in the foyer, uh, and he asked at the end of the conversation, he said, would you just go home and talk to Stephanie? You two pray about it and get back to me in a couple days. I'll be honest with you, after I got off the phone with Dr. Kramer that afternoon, or that morning there in the foyer in Heber Springs, Arkansas, I immediately went across the street, because that was where my office was at, in the house across the street, and I got on my computer and I googled where Belleville, Illinois was. I am not from Illinois, I know that's one of the things that shocks most people when they find out I'm a Cubs fan, uh, as how in the world did an Oklahoma boy uh, grow up to be a Cubs fan, but that's a story for another day, which you all know already by at this point, so it's fine. Uh, but I didn't know where it was at, so I, I went on my computer and I googled Belleville, Illinois, uh, and Sevy and I had spent a few days praying about uh, what God would have us do, where God might be leading, and to make a long story short, uh, at the end of the day, here we are. Uh, and uh, these past five years have been an incredible journey of grace. I don't know if you'll remember this, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands this morning. Uh, for those of you who weren't here five years ago, a little over five years ago, you're exempt from this question, but uh, this is a rhetorical question. How many of uh, you, by not raising your hands, remember my very first message here at Belleville First? Oh, good. A few of you do. That's impressive. Uh, well, it was from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter Four verses 14 through 21, where Jesus, uh, in his hometown of Nazareth, you know, he gets up uh, in the synagogue, he reads from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, uh, this very beautiful, poignant passage about what his ministry was going to look like uh, on earth. Uh, and I ended that message, uh, and I know Hamilton is the big rage right now, right? I mean, it's like playing in our house constantly. Uh, and I love Hamilton, but i am always just been very partial to Les Miserables. Uh, and uh, I ended that message because, if you'll remember, uh, there's, a, there's a song in Les Miserables called, Do You Hear the People Sing? Uh, and I had had that quoted out in my message that first Sunday, but if you're like me, when you hear a musical, you just can't read it, right? You've got to sing it. Uh, and so I, I remember singing that, mess, that, 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 that line from, uh, you know, Les Miserables uh, unintentionally, uh, and uh, that was my first kind of introduction uh, to you and your first introduction really to me uh, as a pastor. And I remember at the end of the service, uh, you had had a welcome reception for us there in the foyer, uh, and uh, a guy by the name of Brendan Kelly uh, came up to me. And of course, at that point, I had no idea who anybody was. Uh, in the church, and he says, he says to me, my wife already loves you. And I'm like, really? I'm like, what have I done? First day, that's amazing. He goes, you sang Les Miserables. And she's like, and he's like, he, she's in love already. And I'm like, wow, that's impressive. Well, wow. one of my favorite memories, uh, one of my favorite memories of the many, uh, was a few years later, Stephanie and I attended, uh, went to the Fox uh, Theater there with the Kelly family, and uh, we got to listen to uh, Les Miserables, and of course, I'm like tears, you know, streaming down my face, and uh, it was just a beautiful, fun memory uh, that, it, for me, captures uh, this journey that, that we have been on together for, for these past five years, but I, I want you to know this. People are still singing. People all across the Metro East, all across the world, all across this country, they're longing for hope. They're longing for redemption. They're longing for rescue and renewal. And as a church, we have that message. And we have an opportunity and we have a privilege to be the people of God, and to share this hope that we have because people 
still long for hope. That will not change until Christ returns. I'm not going to sing for you today. Maybe. Maybe I will. I don't know. We'll see. But I invite you to stand with me this morning and to open up your Bible or your Bible apps to Ephesians chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, going to verse 6. Hear the word this morning. It says, Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. Ephesians as a whole can be broken down into two major sections. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul is, is giving theological instruction to this community of faith that he had formed. And in chapter 2, he really kind of hammers home this concept of unity in the church. At that time, you would have had Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. They would have had very diametrically opposed backgrounds and upbringings. They were coming together because of Christ, but you can only imagine how that would have presented obstacles and uh, chances for disunity to abound in the church. And so Paul spends these first three chapters in Ephesians hammering home this theological instruction and the importance of maintaining unity in the faith. Well, the next major section, chapters 4 through 6, really delve into the ethics of that theological teaching. So you have that right mind, and what that means is that it ought to in- impact the way that you live. And so Paul spends the next three chapters in Ephesians talking about how this life, this new life that we have in Christ ought to be lived. And so from a prison cell, he writes to the church in Ephesus, and this letter would have been circulated to other various churches at that time. And he begs them. Right? I, I really love the NRSV version of that. Right? He begs them to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You see, I think there are some false uh, perceptions at times in the church today, and that is that the only person who was called in this sanctuary is the one who's standing before you now, but that is simply not the case. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are called to live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are called to be a holy people who embody a new ethic and a new way of living in this world. Paul in Romans, he talks about it as he, as he makes his way systematically through Romans. He gets to those very practical chapters at the end, chapters 12 through 16, where he says, and be transformed, right, by the renewing of your minds. I think that is something every church should value more and more today is transformation. That we are being transformed, changed people. If you are the same person that you were five years ago, there may need to be a very needed conversation between you and the Father because the idea is that we continue to grow in grace, to draw deeper into this Love and grace of the Father. That's a good time to say amen. We need to be changed people. I want you to know something from the very bottom of my heart this morning. I am not the same person that I was five years ago that I am today. 
God continues to form me and to shape me and to mold me. I have this uh, jar of, of Play-Doh in my office, and that's really how I tried to be before the Father, is that person who could be moldable and shaped to be who God has called me to be. But you see, when we come to know Christ, that old self, it, it dies, Right? And that new self begins to emerge. And, and what that means is that we have a new set of virtues and ethics that we are to live and to espouse and to embody in this world. And Paul talks about that as he's begging this community of believers to live and to lead a life worthy of the calling. He says that life needs to look like humility. We need to be humble. The last time I checked, not any one of us has it all together here this morning, right? Okay, some of you don't want to confess this morning. That's okay. Let me be the first one to tell you this morning. You don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. Which means that as we continue this journey of grace, we need to be more humble as God's people. By the way, that humility will lead us to kindness. I don't know if you are aware of this or not, but the church could really be more kind today. And would it shock you if I said it's not just to the world? But the church needs to be more kind to its own. We need to be more kind to people. We need to be more gentle. You know, those first two virtues, those are things that uh, in the Western culture, we don't always place a whole lot of value on today. Humility and gentleness. But it's the ethics of the kingdom. It's who Jesus was. If you don't believe me, go and read Philippians chapter 2. Jesus was humble. He was the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And you know what he did in John's gospel? He washed his disciples' feet. I mean, he took the lowest of the low job. There was nothing beneath our Savior, which means that there's nothing beneath us as God's people. Whatever God is calling us to do, whether it is mundane, whether it is behind the scenes, or whether it is up front, we are to do it. Because of the one that we profess to follow. Nothing was beneath him. And so we are to be people who are humble and gentle. But as Paul goes on, we are also to be patient with one another. I'll be the first to admit to you, I am by nature not a very patient person. I really like change. And, and what I was saying to a group of people the other day is that what I really love about this moment in time, don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't love this global pandemic, but what I, what I do appreciate what it has done for us is that it has forced change in the church. It has forced us to adapt and to evolve. And you are going to have to continue to do that. Naples first, as some of you are listening this morning, we are going to have to do that. This has changed everything. The playbook has changed. And we must adapt and we must change some things that need to be changed. And when we do that, what it means is that we must be patient with people. Patience is a virtue. People come into this building and they come from different backgrounds. They come from different walks. They aren't on the same place as we all are. And that is okay because we are to be patient with one another, bearing, as Paul says, with one another in love. Paul in Corinthians 13, right? It's, the, it's the, the one passage that gets read at every wedding. I read it in every wedding that I'm a part of, and, and, I, and I love it, but it's really not about a husband and a wife, right? It's about the church. 
And it's the one, it's the reigning penultimate most important ethic in the church. And what he talks about in that letter is that he says love endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things, trusts all things. But it also bears with one another. Do you understand how important that is for us moving forward? That, that we are patient with one another. That we bear with one another in love. Talk to any husband and wife here this morning, and they will tell you, in order to have a successful marriage, it takes intentional effort. Marriage is hard work, and all married couples said, amen. Some of you said that louder. (laughs) Marriage is hard work, and a good, healthy marriage doesn't happen by accident. It is intentional on each other. Bearing with one another in love. Stephanie has spent the last 17 years training me. And she still has a lot more to go. She didn't say amen there. Okay, good. She has been patient. She has been very gentle with me. Church, I grow weary of the way in which we treat one another in the church today. And how so often that old self continues to rear its ugly head as we have forgotten that God calls us to a new ethic, which means all that gossip, which means all that slander, which means all those other things, they should have died. They should have gone away. They should have been buried six feet under because we are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we have a new set of ethics. And we bear with one another in love maintaining the unity of the Spirit. For the past five years, I have been blessed to have coached my boys in multiple sports. And I loved, I'd I'd be lying to you this morning if I said I loved every second of it. Sometimes it felt a lot like babysitting, but that's okay. But I loved most of it. You know, but the, one of the hardest things to teach a, a group of young athletes that we are one. Whether we step on that basketball court or that baseball diamond or that soccer field or pitch if you're from Europe. When you step out onto that field of competition, we are family. We are one. We win as a team. We lose as a team. And when somebody strikes out for the third time and they're walking back to the dugout with their head held low, you pick them up. You encourage them. Because we are a team. Church, we are on the same side. Unity is hard won. It doesn't happen by accident. But it happens when God's people are intentional about maintaining that unity, that oneness. As Paul begins to end this beautiful section when he reminds us of that oneness, that we are one body, one spirit. We have one Lord, one hope, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is in all, through all, and above all. We as God's people are to live differently, to behave differently, than this world. And it is time now, perhaps more than ever, that we be that kind of people again. These past five years have been an amazing five years. I have seen God do a lot of incredible things over these past five years. You may not know this, but this entire building from top to bottom has been like overhauled. We have a brand new roof. We have every wall in this building has been painted. The landscaping is all brand new. We have four brand new bathrooms. We have a soon-to-be new four-year floor that's going to be out there and ready to greet people. This building is primed and pumped and ready for growth. We have started life groups, and prior to COVID, we had multiple life groups that were meeting all throughout the Metro East, and we were seeing community and connections being formed and shaped and built. 
over the past five years, we have received 34 new Nazarenes by profession of faith. That's not even counting the many who have transferred their membership, like the Reinhardts did last week, and who have become a part of this community of faith. You hired me over five years ago, and you asked us to get younger. And you know what? We have gotten younger. Every year, as a part of our annual report, we have this supplemental report that we have to fill out. And one of the things that the Church of the Nazarene has been asking of us is they want to know our demographic breakdown. Our highest percentage of people in this church are young adults. Now, that does not mean that we have neglected the older adults. We have continued to find ways to minister to you. It hasn't always been perfect But God has been doing a lot of great things in the life of Belleville First over these past five years. There are many things in which you and I and we are to be proud of and ought to be proud of. This past year, we had one of our best years financially we've ever had. When we lost one staff member, when we were going through a pandemic, that speaks to your faithfulness and your generosity. You are a great community of faith. And God is going to continue to do great things in you and through you as you seek to maintain that unity of the Spirit. As you work at being humble and gentle and kind, bearing with one another and maintaining that unity by the Holy Spirit. I am proud of the five years that I have had with you. You have been a remarkable community of faith. Are you perfect? No, you're not perfect. But I'm not perfect either, and that's okay. God loves us through our imperfections. And as long as we seek to be moldable, God will do great things in us and through us, and God will do great things in you and through you. We have seen countless new families come to this church over the last five years. Denise Hand was up here leading us in worship just moments ago. Five years, she was not here. Five years ago, she was not here. Josh, who was our worship director, he wasn't here five years ago. I see a lot of families out there who weren't a part of this church five years ago, who are now a vibrant part and committed a part of this community of faith, and they are serving in countless ways. Thank you for your service. Thank you for the things that you have done. Keep it up. This church needs you more than they know. Keep it up. God has great things in store for you as a community of faith. I truly believe, and I know, I know that you you, you think that because I'm the pastor, I'm supposed to say this. I truly do believe that your best days are ahead of you. I believe that about my time when we were here. Not because of who's in leadership, but because of the God who calls us. He is faithful. He loves this church more than you do. He cares for this church more than you do. Seek Him. Seek Him with all of your heart, with all of your mind. You know, every Tuesday, we have prayer meeting. And I'm going to say this now because you can fire me next. That's fine. (laughs) Every Tuesday we have prayer meeting. And it's Zoom. You should be in that prayer meeting. You know, the most important thing we can do as God's people is pray together. And I know that not every Tuesday you could be there, and that's fine. We don't expect 100% participation and perfect attendance. That'd be great. But you know, the most important thing God's people can do is pray. I had this beautiful conversation with Carol Etling on Thursday. One of my last priestly acts at this church was to serve her communion on Thursday. She sits there and she was talking to me. She goes, I just wish I could do more. I wish that I, you know, would have learned how to drive a car, as she was telling me. And she wished that she could do some other things. And I said, Carol, Carol. I said, you pray, right? She goes, oh, I pray all the time, Pastor. I pray all the time. I said, that's the most important thing you can do. 
That is what we need now more than ever, Carol, is for people like you to pray constantly for this church, to pray constantly for their, your family and for your loved ones. Church, it's the most important thing we could be doing. And if you are a leader in this church, if you are on the board of this church, you need to be there on Tuesday nights. You need to set the example. And you need to be praying. As God's people, it has to be our top priority. Many sermon done. God calls us to a new ethic. He calls us to be a different kind of people. And I'll say this and I'm done. I said it to you several months ago. This church and every church is not a country club. We don't exist for ourselves. We exist for this world. Let me say that to you one more time. This is going to be the last thing I want to say to you as your pastor. Belleville First does not exist for itself. It never has, and it never ought to. The body of Christ exists for the world, to serve it, to be kind. In a world that is so unkind, to be people of grace, and hope. I, like Zachariah, am a prisoner of hope. I get up each and every day. Some days are harder than others, I'll be honest, because I am that prisoner of hope who believes that no matter what, God is at work in this world, and he is calling me to be a part of it. And I try with, humil with humility, with gentleness, with patience and peace to embody the ethic of the kingdom of God until either Christ calls me home, which I hope is a long time from now, or he returns. I pray that he will find Aaron Lynn faithful. And I pray that he will find Belleville first faithful. You should have received on your way in a prepackaged communion element. I shared with you earlier one of my last priestly acts as a pastor was to serve communion with Carol Etling, a saint of the church. I love this meal. I love that Carol Etling loves it so much that she's calling me saying, can you come and serve communion to me? I've never been the host at this table. Christ is the head of this table. It is this meal of grace. It is this meal for the people of God. And it reminds us of the life that we are called to live, this cruciformed life. As he calls us to participate and to be people of the kingdom. You don't have to be a Nazarene to partake of communion. What we ask is that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. This is the feast of God for the people of God. And it is my joy and my privilege to share with you one last time this meal of grace. So if you take the wafer, hear these words. The body of Christ. Broken for you. May you take and eat.
the blood of Christ shed for you and for all. May you take and drink and may it preserve you blameless. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this community of faith, for how we have journeyed together now these past five years, for the miracles that I have seen you do in people's lives for the new people that you have brought to us and that we have loved and that we have embraced. I thank you for the victories that have been won. I thank you for all the many blessings, Lord, and for the opportunity I have had to just be with them. Lord, through some of life's painful times, celebrating also weddings, and various achievements. They are an incredible body of Christ. I pray that you would continue to bless them, equip them, empower them. Help them to be people, Lord, who embody the ethic of the kingdom, who pride humility and gentleness above arrogance, and conceit, who bear with one another in love, who are patient, who are peacemakers, and who maintain the unity of the Spirit. Watch over them. Guide them in the days and weeks ahead. And now to Him, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To Him be glory and the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Go in his peace this morning.